Good evening. I am Nathalie Danier, Assistant Director of Alumni Relations at Baruch College. And on behalf of the Robert C. Weaver Black Alumni Network, we welcome you to our discussion on how the civil rights movement influenced U.S. immigration policy. This evening, you will hear from an expert panel that will discuss the Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965 and its guiding principle that uplifting those most marginalized ultimately benefits everyone, and it continues to inform current immigration debates. But before we begin our program, just a few housekeeping rules. Please keep your microphones muted during the program. And if you have any questions, please type them in the chat and we will address them during the Q&A session. To begin, I have the privilege of introducing our moderator for this evening. Dr. Neil Hernandez is an assistant professor at Baruch College Mark School of Public and International Affairs, where he teaches public and nonprofit management. He previously served as an asylum officer at the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, where he interviewed people seeking protection from persecution and educated their claims. His research focuses on immigration policy and more broadly, the policy implementation process in public agencies. Dr. Hernandez earned his PhD from the CUNY Graduate Center and he holds a JD from Hofstra University and an MPA from Columbia University. Dr. Hernandez is a licensed attorney in New York State and is a member of the Asylum Liaison Committee of the New York chapter of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. And now let us begin our timely discussion. And I turn this program over to Professor Neil Hernandez. Thank you, Nifty. Uh, can you hear me? Just a quick sound check? Yes. Thank you so much. I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge you for your leadership, both in co-founding the Robert Weaver Society, as well as in designing this program. I thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to be here with these incredible panelists uh, for a conversation that's going to focus on the civil rights movement uh, and its influence on the Immigration and Nationality Act's passage in 1965, as well as more broadly, the, uh, the impact on immigration policy. In a moment, I'll walk you through the conversation that I'm hoping to guide in two parts. I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. But before that, I it would be it's important for me to let our panelists introduce themselves uh, as we had discussed. And uh, and as you'll hear their background, you will fully appreciate as I do that this is an incredible opportunity to benefit from their perspectives and their expertise to have this conversation. I turn it over to uh, Dr. DeWart Bell first. Okay, thank you very much. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be on this panel tonight and to listen to all of those degrees that Dr. Hernandez has earned uh, and justly so. I, I am a 1999 graduate of Baruch from the executive program. I'm also an uh, adjunct assistant professor at Baruch. Um, what I do is hard to categorize sometimes, but I am a social justice activist. And all I do, whether it's communications, consultant work, or what have you, is really in what comes out of that background. I am the founder and president of a nonprofit organization called LEAD, L-E-A-D, Intergenerational Solutions. And yes, that's exactly what we do. I'm also the author of the book, Lighting the Fires of Freedom, African-American Women in the Civil Rights Movement. I am the co-editor of a book on uh, of the Derrick Bell Lectures based on the lecture series that I founded at New York University School of Law on the, to honor my late husband, Derrick Bell. That book is called Race, Rights, and Redemption. And my forthcoming book, I always like to talk about books, is called Blackbirds Singing. It's inspirational speeches of Black women from the Civil War to the 21st century. I'm also a civil rights movement veteran, veteran having served uh, in several states in the, in the Deep South, not a long time, so I don't have the deep experience as a lot of people. And I've been an activist all my life for peace, uh, LGBTQ rights, and others. And I am... I, 
will end by saying that I bleed Baruch blue. I love Baruch. I love the promise of Baruch. And it's been such a pleasure to be associated with Baruch. And um, I I would like to acknowledge my co-teacher, my summer co-teacher who is on this Zoom, and that's Dr. Naomi Nightingale joining us from Los Angeles. We teach every summer a leadership uh, course in the in the, in the, in the in the program there and lastly i'll say that uh i have a scholarship an endowed scholarship at brute college because i believe so much in what the in what the college is trying to do so go baruch thank you janet let me ask uh dr eversley to please uh, uh introduce herself as well well, it's really difficult to follow Dr. <laughs> Dr. Dor Bell. Um, my name is Shelley Eversley. I am um, interim chair of Black and Latinx Studies at Baruch. I'm a professor uh, in the English department as well as the English department at the Graduate Center. <coughs> I'm so sorry. Um, and I'm excited to be here. I mean, I, I publish in, in, in critical race theory and I, um, my specialization is right in the middle of the 20th century around the rise of the civil rights movement. And most recently, a book I've edited for Cambridge on the 1960s and transitions in the culture and literature of the 1960s just came out. And I'm really, I should also say that I am first generation um, born in the United States. My entire family, everyone born a minute um, before me, um, was born in another country, and I grew up very um, uh, understanding and clear and participatory in um, the experience of, of lots of people who were immigrating to um, the United States. And so I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Shelley. I'd like to now ask um, who I consider to be a public intellectual and a researcher, Yvette Lagan today to please introduce herself. Yvette? Well, thank you. First, I'm just really very honored to be a participant in this panel with these esteemed panelists um, who I'm very impressed with. For, for me, I am immigration. That's what my entire working life, I've worked in immigration and retired from government after more than 30 years in that field. Uh, some of my positions um, include, uh, just in, in New York to, to start, is, which is where I started my career, I ran the naturalization program in New York. Then um, I was public spokesman for the agency in New York. I opened the first legalization office that was in the, from the 1986 Act. And I was the director of the New York Asylum Office, where we adjudicated those claims for political asylum. And in the national field, I went to Washington. I was uh, the deputy director for the International Affairs Program after serving in Mexico, where I was the regional attache for immigration programs, and that was all types of programs, both benefits and enforcement programs throughout the, throughout the hemisphere, throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, in, in after, um, after we ended the Immigration Naturalization Service as a result of the 2003 Homeland Security Act, we stood up the Department of Homeland Security. I was on, <coughs> excuse me, on the team at the White House designing the Department of Homeland Security, and I served as its first director of international operations. I'm proud to have a degree from Baruch, a uh, master's in public administration. I currently chair the advisory board of, my, of a migrant immigrant refugee rights alliance. I serve on the advisory committee of the Pan American Development Foundation, which is an arm of the organization of the American states. I'm on several other nonprofit boards and I'm proud to be here today with you to talk about immigration policy. Thank you, Yvette, very much. Um, so uh, audience members, I, I wanted you to know that our, our, our run of show includes turning it over to you at uh, 7 p.m. So I just want you to know that time frame that we have. And the way I've structured the that I'm going to be structuring the conversation is in two parts. I'm hoping that we can benefit from our panelists' incredible perspectives to fully appreciate the forces and the priorities of the civil rights movement. And then in the second part, I'm hoping that we can delve into some of the uh, value elements of the 1965 Immigration Nationality Act, and then really looking forward about its, its impact and then what may, be, what may be left to do. 
that said, I'd like to start with the civil rights movement, and in particular, focusing on its forces and its priorities. I'm going to start with the with the Janet first. Uh, Janet, I'm glad you touched on your your incredible book, Lighting the Fires of Freedom. Uh, as as uh, as uh, I came to learn, uh, it was a uh, it was nominated for in 2019 for an NAACP award. And uh, I was taken, uh, I just enjoyed understanding that in, in 1966, you withdrew from Howard University to, to actively be involved in the in the civil rights movement. You followed your, your mother's lead, Willie Mae Brooks Neal, and you talked about her uh, and many other women that you amplify their voices in, in your book about the incredible servant leadership that they exhibited, whether it was raising money or providing housing, but really making a big momentous push as part of the civil rights movement. Um, and you talk about in your book how the movement and, and, and these women helped to construct a cultural architecture for change. Can you tell us about that? Can you give us more of, the, of, the, of, of their role and your role in shaping these, these forces and these priorities in the civil rights movement? Yes, it's hard to imagine how people who were so, whose society had tried to oppress really broke through and had vision and thought how they could plan. They, they were future focused and they were strategic because as servant leaders, they realized that they were trying to create a world that they themselves might never see. And so they started, they started there and they, it, and it was born out of conviction of, of great morality and ethics and courage. They courage to take risks because when people did, when they, you know, those of us who I say parachuted in, I, I was born and raised in Erie, Pennsylvania. My mother was born and raised in rural Arkansas, which is why I had a, have a real, one of the reasons I have a real connection to the Deep South. My mother, who was denied the possibility of going to high school because the nearest high school for Black children was 100 miles away, always believed in education. And you acknowledge I dropped out of Howard University on a full honor scholarship, which almost broke my mother's heart, but she understood and she was always supportive. And there were a lot of young people who did that. The civil rights movement was really intergenerational, but when you think about it, it was the young people who were on, many of the young people who were on the front lines, people we've we've come to know in later in later years, and we don't see them as the 18, 19, 20 year old, 20 year olds that they that they were. But the the civil rights movement, which informed this con this country, although the country forgot many of those lessons, was really a moral movement, trying not only to liberate black people who came here as enslaved. I mean, we 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 have a uh, strange relationship with the idea of immigration enslaved African Americans. But later on, as we see in the 20th, 20th century and 21st century, when we talk about immigration, black people are part of many of, of many areas in the country. So I want, I hope we talk can talk about that a little bit. But I think that what the civil rights movement did in terms of uh immigration, I I I decided to do a little research before this panel because I knew that I was not anywhere near the expert at, as other people on this panel are in terms of immigration. And what I discovered, what is uh, one thing, and I would just like to 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 read just this one line. It's from the Asian American Education Project, which is was co-founded by a person I know, Stuart Quo and has on its advisory board several other people I know. And one of the things that they say in terms of the civil rights movement said through the civil rights movement in 1965, now remember there'd been a Voting Rights Act in 1964, and that was that was pushed by uh, black liberation people. You know, at sometimes we call ourselves civil rights activists, but really it was a freedom movement. And it was, just, and it was it was really highlighted by people working in the Deep South. But through that movement, 
immigration based on a quota system was determined that it favored the Western European nations over others. The U.S. Congress changed the immigration system from a quota system to a preference system, including family reunification. And I was talking to a student last night at NYU uh, at a scholarship reception, and she said to me it's based on three, th three things broadly. Love, if you, your relationship with other people, work, and fairness. Now, we know this is an ideal, and that's not always the case. And the immigration system, I think, is still, un is still unfair, but at least it's, it's better than it was. Thank you, Janet, very much. Um, Shelley, uh, I'm glad you touched on, on your book that you co-edited because I, I enjoyed uh, perusing it as well in, in preparation for our conversation today. Uh, but those that didn't catch it before, Shelley co-edited the book titled African American Literature in Transition. And as she pointed out, it was released in November 2022. What what One of the things that struck me was how your expert opinion here is so critical. Because when we think about the movement, we might think about it and just think about what we see, so actions. But it's so important, as you know, from your expertise, words and images and art. And I think you beautifully uh, captured that in your book when you articulate that in the 1960s, Black literature and culture inspired personal investment, quote, in, pu in public and political change. And you go on to note that the word, quote unquote, Negro uh, became an outdated term uh, to describe uh, those who had African-American descent. And you explained that transition between using that word and black. And you um, just brought it all together by explaining how it's uh, the term became one of both uh, uh, self-defiance uh, and then something that Janet touched upon, self-love as well. Uh, how did you see from your lens the, the, uh, the uh, civil rights movement, its forces, its priorities, uh, so that we can more fully appreciate how th they actually created this monumental change in the in the 1965 Act. Well, I will say personally, it created all the possibilities that have me here with everyone tonight. Personally, right? My parents came from um, Guyana in South America, and they were um, trained as nurses, um, mostly through the um, collaborations emerging from Cuba. And I'm saying this too, because I think maybe also because I'm chair of Black and Latinx Studies at Baruch, it's really important for us to think about not just um, civil rights and we talk about it, we always think about Black people, um, which is obviously important because Black people are very much leading the way. Um, but it's also important to think about the ways in which Black people have always been working in coalition with all kinds of people, um, especially now as chair of BLS, I think about this with 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 Latino people in particular, the diversity of 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 Latino people or people who are from parts of the world um, that would include Latin America and Central America. Um, but personally, right, my story is my parents' story. They came to the United States as workers. They were they they kind of had the access because of that 1965. Um, immigration um, Nash Nationality Act that afforded people with skills. And my parents came to the United States late in the 60s as nurses, and they had choices for where they could go. And my father ended up running um, a methadone clinic in the south side of Chicago, and it changed my life. Immediately, my parents landed and were middle class um, and then they soon after they had me and I had all the privileges associated with middle classness, which doesn't always happen with African Americans, right? When they come up through the ranks of America and the segregation of America. And one of the reasons I think that my parents were able to be, to create a life for their children and for themselves um, was because of segregation in America. They didn't teach black people how to be nurses at the at, at the moment after Vietnam and during Vietnam when in fact you had all these 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 crises in the ghettos in the hood in the black and Latinx communities that white people who had the skills didn't want to do so my parents arrived in um, the United States in Chicago 
to work and they worked because they had skills and they were admitted because they had skills. They received those skills um, because of Cuba. And then they were able to do jobs that white people didn't want to do. And black people were black Americans or few and far between because they didn't have access to the education. And so it's kind of a double edged thing is what I'm trying to say about um, about the 1965 act and how we're thinking about civil rights, how we think about civil rights and, and migration, civil rights and immigration. It's always two sided, right? Because one of my, my parents achieved some advantage because the state, the United States was practicing so much inequality among its own citizens. And then they had this need um, to fill right because all these soldiers are coming back from 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 vietnam and and after and during vietnam there's this rise in 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 an opiate addiction and you know so that's my story that's the short version right so when i think about it personally that's what i think when i think about it as an educator um and as a chair of a department i'm thinking about how to teach this in a way that students can use not just as a history lesson but how they can use it as they they shape the future and as they imagine themselves shaping the future. I'm so proud of our school, Baruch, because it is a sanctuary school. I'm so proud of um, our school in that we hire people without asking about their their documents um, when it comes to hiring faculty and so we can support and sponsor their, their immigration. Um, I'm so proud of our school because we are thinking about the fact that in New York City, everyone deserves an education. And that means that students who may have been dreamers who are still waiting for certain documents can still get their education as they're waiting and that changes lives. And um, I'm really proud of that. So when I think about it, civil rights, I think about the struggle that continues and I think about the ways that, that we have to teach history as the past, the present, and also the future. Thank you, Shelley. <laughs> uh, Yvette, uh, as I touched upon earlier, um, you, while you have significant practitioner experience, which I'm, I'm gonna ask about as well, uh, you also are a researcher. You have a project, if you'll indulge me, that focused on your family, uh, starting with your uncle Bobby Clark, and you trace that family uh, uh, and their history, uh, three generations of being enslaved. Um, and when I was thinking about your important work about not only unearthing those stories, but others uh, about enslaved people, it reminded me of uh, Professor Anna Law from Brooklyn College talking about how we can't talk about immigration policy without talking about slavery because, uh, and, the, and the evil vestiges of slavery because as she puts it, and these are not my words, as she puts it, uh, uh, slavery had a pernicious, it was an, a pernicious economic system. It was also a, a, uh, a, social, a pernicious social control system, but it, it, it also powerfully influenced immigration policy. What's your perspective uh, from that historical perch and any perspective as well, of you see these, as you see these forces and priorities in the civil rights movement? On mute? That's a good question. And I would broaden from slavery and its impact. It's really about white supremacy that has always been and has had an impact on immigration policy and immigration legislation. And that was the big thing about the 1965 Act, that it was overturning the racist policies that had been built in to all of the previous immigration legislation. The, it was overturning the national origins perspective that was designed to give preferences to Northern Europeans. So out of you know, the 1965 Act established quotas, but the quotas were equally distributed in the regions around the world. Previously, the formula they used excuse me, was based on the number, the percentage of individuals who were in, already in the United States, the ethnic origin or the national origins of those individuals. And since throughout the ages, preference for immigration had been given to Northern Europeans, they had the highest percentages and therefore got the largest block of numbers 
to be able to legally immigrate to the United States. So the 1965 Act overturned that. And I think, you know, in terms of the civil rights movement related to that, the civil rights movement in the whole era created a disposition in the United States that favored a very favored legislation that was creating an equitable, equitable system. So, and that was part of the discussion then was, well, we've had this white, these white supremacist systems that were overturning or trying to overturn through legislation with the Civil Rights Act. Let's, and we look at immigration and we see how biased it is. So in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the discussion, <coughs> eat my cough drops. <coughs> Take your time, Vivek. <coughs> Just <coughs> give me a break. <laughs> and take, take your time. Um, as um, and and I appreciate you putting the ideology and that force of white supremacy on the table, following uh, Shelley's lead. And thinking about that, the comment uh, and the in the analysis that Janet provided about it took a coalition that was intergenerational. Intergenerational. It included women in the civil rights movement. And Shelley speaking about using history to to move forward. What the th what do the three of you see as some of the lessons that are, that we can take from the civil rights movement as we look forward, particularly with immigration policy? I'd like to to say something that is it's a it's a very uh, it, it's 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 a tough thing to explain in a sense, but this whole this idea of skills and you know that and that I think as we look forward, we have to see. I think there's a trap with 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 defining what skills are when um, when enslaved Africans came here in 1619. Some say they were here before because they came in Florida from uh, South America. But at any rate, we'll start with 1619. Those people were, there, there was an intentional um, taking of people who had skills, who could plant, who were farmers, who were architects. They didn't have the titles, what have you. They built this society. They built this economy. And to keep them uneducated, you know, so that, uh, that, so they didn't get the benefits of the skills that they have. And that's the same thing that I find that I find with my research talking about people in the civil rights movement and looking at the people in the rural South in particular who were unlettered. And so by the um, by the the way we talk about skills, you know, uh, being educated and what have you, they did not particularly have skills. So, so there, there is that, there is, there is that uh, irony, as it was talked about earlier. But they were skilled, and so we, as it, we need to acknowledge that that, and we need to, as we go forward have an appreciation and redefine the kinds of skills that people had. I always say that um, it, Black Americans, enslaved Black Americans, really taught this country a number of things because they, they're, even though they, their languages were, were the African languages were destroyed, people were separated and all that kind of thing, there is still, there there is somehow the indomitable human spirit. There was still a legacy of people who came and who who built the uh, who had a vision so that they so that they could really build upon that. If you look in the, for example, the Georgia Sea Islands, which was a place in the civil rights movement, right? And that and that's a place where a lot of, uh, uh, there, there, there are many different people from many different African tribes there. And so one of the things they tried to preserve the African languages and that was, and so the slavers, of course, they didn't want us to, they didn't want us to talk talk among ourselves. So we, we, we made up spirituals and field hollers and things like that, but those people and their, and their, their kin and others really were foundational in many ways to the civil rights movement, because they talked about, they 
had a sense of history, even though they might not be able to read a generation back or something like that, but they had a sense of history. And if you have a sense of history, I think you have a sense of the future. Take that, Governor DeSantis. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Shelley, would you like to jump, jump in on that question? Um, I'm going to wait. I'm going to pass because Yvette is not coughing right now. And I really wanted to hear, I was excited when she pointed out white supremacy as fundamental to the shaping of immigration policies and even the 1965 act that we're talking about today. And I'd like to kind of focus on that a little bit, especially as we think about the future and the present, right? I mean, we are in New York City and they're dropping off busloads of people today. And I think the idea that we don't understand ourselves connected to the present and future generations of, of migrants um, is, is something that we have to work on. And I would love it if you could explain more about what you were gonna say, Yvette. Thank well, you. I'm looking down because you're in the lower lower corner of my screen. No by the way. Let's see how long I can talk without coughing. But I mean, and you know, I'd like to add to Neil's question too about the future because I was talking about the past and what the previous immigration directions were, or the policies and the legislation was in the 1965 Act. It did have the impact of changing the demographics of the immigrants. You know, although in the debate in 1965 there were those, and you know, especially our former Senator, now deceased, Strom Thurmond, he was pretty, you know, outspoken. You know, we don't really want to change who comes to America. We, you know, we like the kind of Americans that are dominating the situation now and who are the majority. But what, what this has led to is just a continuation of the same, of the same arguments that were used to oppose immigration before based on the demographic change. And so these, these arguments, they may change the terms where they're using replacement theory, but they're talking about the same thing. They don't like the change in the complexion of, the, of who is coming to live in America. So where pre-1965, the term eugenics, if you're familiar with that, saying that there are certain types of people who are superior to other types of people, and at that time, it kind of started with opposition to Southern European immigration. They were Northern Europeans who were these eugenicists, this kind of pseudo theory, they thought were the superior ones. And they had all kinds of arguments, oh, those Southern Europeans, they're short, they're darker, all of this, you know, they obviously were a different race, but race is fungible. So now we're here where we are now and races, Europeans are okay, regardless of where they are from, they, Eastern Europeans are okay. Southern Europeans are okay, but now this concern with the majority of our immigrants are coming from Latin America and Asia. Those who are who are spouting the replacement theory, which says there is a, a conspiracy to replace white people by bringing people in from other parts of the world to take away power from white people. And, you know, of course, this is preposterous. Immigration is a global issue. It's not a domestic conspiracy. It, it is prompted by global conditions. Europeans stopped wanting to immigrate in the numbers that they had, that they had been immigrating. It's because post-World War II, Europe became more prosperous. They didn't have the pull factors. They were not being pulled to come to the U.S. for economic reasons. And plus the way the new... 1965 Act changed the way people were prioritized to enter the United States based on family relationships and skill, but particularly family relationships. Um, that also changed demographically who was able to come in based on who had these relationships. So it so turned out that newer immigrants tended to be able to pull into more immediate or closer family relationships and, and, and so there, the numbers have exploded and the numbers will continue that way. But what, you know, what to say in, to refute kind of this is that, again, remember I said this eugenics movement started with what was Northern Europeans. They were so afraid, you know, like, let's even go to the 1800s, the mid 1800s. They were so afraid of Irish Catholics. That was going to change the nature of America. Then it was Italians, these Southern Europeans coming in. That was going to change the nature of America. 
Then it was Eastern Europeans they were afraid of. That was going to change America. They were so afraid of this. And none of this has happened. None of this has changed the changed what the America's civic values are. None of this has changed with the type of government that we have, that the way we the way we approach governing, the way we approach our social system. And it won't change because because we have more people who have Hispanic last names or we have more people who have Asian ancestry. It's not going to change because what we do in America with Im immigrants in our process is that we try to integrate people into our civic, civic values. <clears throat> and that's the continuation. <clears throat> Coughing point. <laughs> I'll, I'll, we'll come back. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yvette, for for doing for joining that and, and adding to that, and also Shelley for. Uh, bringing her, uh, bringing Yvette into the conversation. Let's, since we're there already, let's focus a little bit more on the uh, 1980 65 Act and its and its uh, and its impact. And, and Shelley's already talked about today. What what does it mean? So if if uh, Professor um, Gabriel Chin is right that the 1965 Civil Rights Act is part of a, a package with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, and it and it created a racial egalitarian at least principle. Uh, why is why is in practice that's become so elusive? Do you think, Janet Shelley? It's really uh, what uh, Yvette said, and that is the is white supremacy. White supremacy mutates; it just does, because they um, first of all, when when people when we talk about the lack of change. I mean, when we that we somehow in many in many cases, the immigration issue really has to go back a little bit in terms of indigenous people and how indigenous people uh, are. You know, we we have to be informed by what this land was before we started bringing people from other places, whether as uh, enslaved Africans. Or, or whether as uh, uh, Chinese who we exploited and then and then excluded that kind of thing, or or today when we talk about immigration, we we still come up with with class system and with names that separate people. I always ask the question: What are the difference? What's the difference between migrants, uh, refugees? And immigrants, because we use those terms, and 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 you know which ones that are used in a negative way. So we talk about, uh, for, so for example, we talk if we talk about migrants, we depersonalize, we dehumanize uh, our brothers and sisters who are traveling who are traveling from one place to another for what for whatever reason. So I think. One of the things I, I would like to see in terms of the immigration discussion is to find a terminology, and I don't have it, that is more neutral in, in that it's it's neutral in one way, and then it's all and it's inclusive in another way because it treats people, as my mother would say, I quote her a lot, it treats people like people. Thank you, Janet. Uh, before I come back to Yvette Shelley, do you want to jump in on that question? Why, why, the, 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 despite the fact that we have this egalit racial egalitarian principle from the 65 Act, it's proved so elusive, including uh, an example that you gave contemporary now, migrants coming to New York City. Well, I would say that it probably was never egalitarian, just like so many other civil rights acts. And I think that while it represents some progress or, you know, we shouldn't be so 100% pessimistic. Um, we should also be realistic when we think about um, some of the failures of, of civil rights acts or the failure to fall through on, on major landmarks and, and legal moments. Um, They're supposed to have advanced um, equality in America. 
Um, again, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about this even, even in, in the personal experience that I just began describing, right? Because, um, you know, my parents soon arrived to the United States and they got called all kinds of names all the time. The Klan, you know, terrorized my family when, when, when I was a child and my parents didn't feel like they, they had any protections because they were still on green cards. And, um, and that was because they were black with green cards. Um, and when we think about voting and we think about, you know, civil rights acts that were supposed to protect people's voting rights, knowing full well that we see even today that people do not have the protections of the federal government when it comes to being able to vote. Um, and when we think about the idea of unifying families, I mean, it's just devastating that we're not all talking about the horrors at the at the borders of the United States, especially when it comes to people of color. Um, and I think that's something that um, the experts in this room, like you, Neil, and you, Yvette, have lots to say. And so I'm just going to listen <laughs> and, you know, keep pointing. But I, I'm, I'm here ultimately because, you know, here I am chairing a department and we just built this new major. And the students want to be involved in and in, in in helping build a different or a more just future. And I think it's really important for us and the alumni in this space and the faculty, people who are teaching, for us to really think about how the lessons and the conversations we have can become tools or inspiration for our students and for the next generations to apply some of this knowledge for actually doing better than the generation before them. Could I just jump in and say one thing? And that is that I always have hope. And the students add to that. I had 25 students in the winter session and they are, they, they represent great diversity. It, it, and I, I just, and I had, a couple of undocumented students who were very, who um, just added so much to with, the, with their insight and about their journey and what have you. But they have hope. I have hope, and I always push that because without without hope, the people perish. So even though I sometimes have a very, um, uh, I, I I I guess. Um, my, my my analysis sometimes seems seems to be it might seem like it's negative, but it's negative to, in terms of the system wanting for systemic change. But it's always infused with hope and love. Thank you, Janet. And uh, Shelley, I'll just correct you slightly to say you are an expert as well, particularly in a conversation where we want to have a holistic approach to a problem and to potentially a. Uh, a conversation with our participants and our audience members about maybe a, maybe a solution. Um, Yvette, can I follow up? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> and I do want to say that I really appreciate everyone. And I just, I really appreciate Dr. Bell, very positive words, because I think I'm, what I'm going to say is a little bit, <laughs> a little bit sadder and more negative, you know, because what we see here in terms of what, you know, the racial, an egalitarian approach and it's elusive in America and it's elusive everywhere. All parts of the world, people are looking at each other as others and, and as different and trying to find schemes for one group to have some type of supremacy over another. So it's not something that is unique to the United States, but this is my country. So this is the one that I want to talk about and the one that I want to correct. And when it comes to immigration, what we, you know, we see that Immigrants, as I mentioned, the Irish, they merged into what is the predominant population. The white population became the dominant, dominant part of the dominant population. The Italians did also. And, and, you know, and we may see other groups do that eventually, too. And as you know, I think it's Isabel Wilkerson in her book, Cast, that I know many people read about it, that still African-Americans in particular remain at the lowest caste level. And that's, you know, that is the, that is the foundation of America, that, that America was set up that way. And that is the hardest thing to overcome. And because it's so fundamental to what is America and America's 
you know, if, although it may be very subtle and unspoken belief system, it's also often adopted by immigrants who come here. And since it's so, you know, even if it's unspoken to them, it somehow becomes adopted. And so I think that is the, the biggest burden as, a, as, you know, as Americans. We should be welcoming to immigrants. You know, if we look at this at the macro level, immigration is a tremendously important to the nation for our economic growth. We, it, we get all types of skills that we need from the lowest skill to the highest skills. We require immigration to, to meet our needs. But we, but we can't forget that we have a social ill that keeps African-Americans at the bottom of this pile. And there is the resistance among white supremacists to more non-white immigration without really considering the fact that the white population cannot grow sufficiently to meet America's needs. It won't grow, but, but as you saw in this previous presidential administration, they were willing to reduce immigration to, to its lowest levels in a long time and hurt the nation because what is more important to them is to try to slow down the demographic decline of the white population. So you know, there are all of these very powerful negative forces, but we have to keep that in mind as we listen to the immigration debate, that that is what's underlying this anti-immigration because there's no practical reason. There's no, there's no real reason because it's not doesn't hurt our economy. It doesn't hurt us socially. It doesn't hurt us in any of these ways. But the real, the thing that may be unspoken, although sometimes it is spoken on a certain news station, it's pretty much said, some of the anti-immigrant websites, if you read what they what they write, it's pretty much said, but we but, but we can't forget that that's there as we as we listen to all of these immigration debates and anti-immigration debates. Yvette, I, I couldn't uh, do my job properly if I didn't ask you about policy implementation. So I've been I've been chomping at the bits to transition a little bit. Especially as we look at uh, towards the future, and I, I, and, and because you've been at so high a level, at the, at the Justice Department, at the Immigration and Naturalization Service, as you pointed out, you helped to design the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, but I also appreciate what you said earlier. Even though there was a removal of the National Origins Law with the 1965 Act, there still there were numerical limitations, as you pointed out. Uh, and uh, with family unification, while there was uh, uh, some progress on family unification, it favored those who were here and who were citizens here. And so it was harder for that family reunification to occur for newer folks. So when I say all that, I mean to say that a lot happens in policy implementation. A lot happens in agencies. And you've had that role where you've been uh, you've been at a high at that high level including uh, administering, as we discussed pre-conversation, -pre the legalization program that I called the amnesty program. And then you corrected me and, and gave me some, 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 some history there. Uh, how, how focused should we be on policy implementation? If, 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 if Shetley's right, and, and I agree with her, that we have these ideals, but when they come into practice, there are, there are conflicts in, org in agencies, for example. How real is that inside an organization? And maybe you could tell us a little bit more about the legalization program after after I think it was IRCA in 1986, the Immigration Reform and Control Act. Well, the Immigration Reform and Control Act was uh, 20 years after the 1965 Act, and the country again was at the same debate of whether or not we do we want these you know all of these these numbers of people to have some a path to citizenship, and you know just the kinds of things that go on in policy that it was called legalization instead of amnesty because somehow the word amnesty had been turned around. But what I, you know, something I really want to say is, you know, I'm a student from Baruch. I come from a family. One, I have one line that is American. The, the other lines are all immigrants also in my, in my own family history. But I come from a middle-class family in Queens, New York. And a lot of our Baruch students come from sim similar backgrounds immigrant backgrounds. And on the policy tables in Washington, it is so important to have this type of representation in policy discussions. Even if you have well-meaning people 
who do not have this diversity in their background, both economically and ethnically, there are so many things that they will not consider that will not come to their minds. And that's, that's been kind of my experience at the table to say, well, have you thought about this from this perspective, from the perspective of the person in this situation? Because you haven't been in that situation, so it didn't come to your mind. So what we see, what I see in Baruch and what's coming forward from other public administration graduates and, and other programs in Baruch is that the importance of the experience that they will bring to where they go, whether it be in government or other organizations where policy is being set that has an impact on people. They're bringing a unique set of experiences that isn't always there at the top, on the top lines, the top of the tables where policy is being made anywhere. So I congratulate Baruch on educating these future leaders. And I, know, I don't think I answered your question completely on 1986, but that was the last really major overhaul of the immigration laws. And again, it was this, this tremendous compromise that had to be reached in Congress in order to do that. So the, so the bill, just like we talk about now at immigration, um, comprehensive reform, this compromise of enforcement actions, increasing enforcement, and increasing benefits. In order, if you want to give a few more benefits, you have to promise to enforce more at the border, stop this, um, the irregular migration, the illegal entries into the border, which of course can never be stopped. But in my observation since 1986, that the other side, the anti-immigrant opponents, they keep upping the ante in terms of what type of enforcement they want. And so, such that we've seen presidents, you know, like we saw first George W. Bush at a time when there was a great deal of bipartisan support for immigration reform in Congress. He thought that he could get a comprehensive immigration reform over the line and pass, but he could not because the other side kept upping the ante. And there are also, you know, on the, on the pro-immigrant side, sometimes they, they insist on things that the, the, uh, the other side, the anti, will not agree to, and that can kind of stop negotiations too, but it's for the most part, it's what we keep seeing. And then we saw in the Obama administration, he thought that he could negotiate there, that administration that they could negotiate in Congress on this by upping their enforcement as, as these certain members of Congress, you up your enforcement, you do more deportations, okay, and we'll play with you on, on doing this immigration relief and never did. So finally, that's why he had to go to an executive order or what we now have, if we call the DREAMers, DACA, to give some type of status to people who entered as children and have, re have resided as Americans all their lives in the US. Yet this was done and we still cannot, even though the majority of Americans support regularizing the status in a permanent way for this specific group of people and for other groups of people as well, cannot get that passed in Congress. And I go back to those same anti-immigrant immigrant forces that are really still, the un their underlying reason is white supremacy, who are in, in a battle against giving any, any leniency to sets of immigrants who are, who are not European. So the legacy of 1986, the last time we were able to have this liberal kind of um, amnesty, what we call legalization program under Republican administration, the Reagan administration, bipartisan support, bipartisan opposition as well. The other thing that comes from some of these agreements where we up enforcement are like the unanticipated consequences. The unanticipated consequence of the 1965 act was were those who were short-sighted and they kind of believed it wasn't going to change America demographically. But quickly we saw that those changes, the, the, those who believed it but would have opposed it anyway because they just couldn't see that far ahead. But what sometimes what we don't see from enforcement measures is the result is more immigration. We have more people who, who may have come to work for a year or two decide to stay and settle in where before these increased enforcement measures we had more what's called circularity. Mexican men as a rite of passage typically would come and work for a while in the US, 
take their earnings and go back home, get married, start a family. And as they saw perhaps a need to buy a home or want to start a business, come back and work for a couple of years because it was easy. They could count on the fact that they could cross the border and work in the US and do that. But once it became more difficult, particularly in the 1990s, as a result of this increased enforcement that was agreed to in the 86 Act, and again in the 90 Act, more people who would have to stay a short period of time, they settled into the US. And once they stayed, and became settled and they make and got a status, then they also wanted to bring in their families. So that was sort of an unanticipated consequence that has actually resulted in more migration and more migrants settling in the US. If if I might, Yvette, thank you. And Janet, bear with me. Uh, The good thing about saying that I would turn it over to the audience at seven is I could supervise myself to make sure that I turned it over at seven. I actually wanted to ask you about what advice you have for advocates and, and students and alum to move forward on trying to get to a, a racial egalitarian uh, principle. But I see that uh, Jacqueline and Shakira are already bringing those kind of questions up. So I turn it over to Sashay to please uh, share the questions from the chat for our panelists. Yes, thank you so much. So we've gotten some great questions. I've gotten some uh, privately through the chat and then we have some that we can all see so i'm going to start with one of them that i was sent to um privately and this goes for the panelists um along with the moderator as well um so the question is will the immigration issue ever get better with the rise of white supremacy I, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to borrow from, from um, Janet when she says we need to be hopeful. And I'm also going to lean into um, the point that um, Yvette was making about um, the cycles. And, and then I'm going to say something really plain. There's more of us than the white supremacists in the end, right? So that's the hopeful answer. And I think what so many people forget to do is to actually build coalition. And when I say that, I'm thinking about comradeship. I'm thinking about not just being an ally when it's convenient for you, but I'm thinking about the fact that the struggle that um, people coming through the southern borders of the United States are experiencing is a struggle that is mine as well. And I do not see a difference. You know, I don't see like, oh, I don't speak Spanish, so I don't, I can't meet those buses. Um, And I think ultimately we can defeat all kinds of things when we come together to defeat it. And when I say that, I mean, even in the classroom, we have to talk about these things in the specifics. We have to talk about these things in the, in the idea of preparing people, um, the generations of people that Eva was talking about, the people who are enrolled in our classes at Baruch, the people who are alumni at Baruch, so they get the skills that they need to go get the jobs, to go sit at the table and negotiate hard um, and to, to, to do what they have to do. And other people will be activating hard. When I say activating, I mean marching in the streets or writing those, those, those op-eds and, and editorials and educating and tweeting as long as Twitter still is whatever we think it's supposed to be. But, you know, but actually all of us doing our part. And I think that the idea that we can just sort of sit back and talk about this um, in the privacy of our own homes is not enough. I'm done. (laughs) Would anybody else like to tackle that question? I'm not sure I can add to that. That was an excellent response. But I will say this to those who are who are worried about how immigration will change the complexion of America. So the question I ask people is, so so what? What if we become a majority minority country? What is that? What is it about that that frightens you so much? And they don't have an answer. But but part of the answer that I would say is that you are projecting onto people the the systemic racism and um, oppression that that you have inherited, and 
for your own salvation, you need to break away from it. <laughs> That's <laughs> Thank you so much. I don't know. Does anyone else want to add anything to that question before we move on to the next one? Okay. So I will move on to one of the other questions we actually have in the chat. And I'm just going to go ahead and quote our audience member, unless um, Jacqueline, you want to unmute yourself and ask, or would you like me to read it for you? I'm so sorry. If you can read it for me, that would be super awesome. Right. I'm trying to check out. No, no perfect. So yes, I will read in your behalf. So Jacqueline states in the chat, as an immigrant myself, Montserrat, I like to do more to help others. What are some places I can volunteer? I'll just, I'll jump in there. There are so many places to, to volunteer and you, you do a web search, they will jump out at you. And it depends on what your skill sets are, language sets on how you can help. There are churches all over New York City and all over the country who are just collecting clothing to help these migrants that are being bussed about with, and they have really nothing. So there are just so many things that you can do right now. There are, um, they're looking for sponsors for Haitians who are now qualifying under this new provision, Haitian and Nicaraguans who are now under the new provision recently um, started by the, by the Biden administration to allow some some status under some status for um, Haitians and Nicaraguans and certain nationalities, but they need sponsors for them in order for them to be able to, to have this entry. So that's something else you might look into, whether you can sponsor or whether you can help find sponsors or whether you can help get the information out. There's just such a long list of things that you can do for help. And I just do a Google search and it'll come up all over the place. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I hope um, that was helpful, Jacqueline. <laughs> So we have a few other questions on the chat. Um, so we're going to go with Shakira's. So she has two questions. So I'm going to read them out. Um, and again, anyone can answer. So with the degradation of federal civil rights protections, how can advocates effectively push forward progressive immigration solutions while existing in a climate where civil protections for under policies like the CRA or Voting Rights Act are surgically dismantled through the courts in order to target my, minoritized communities. Whoa. <laughs> and for reference, the question is in the chat if anyone wants to reread um, Sorry, as Dr. well. <laughs> I wanted to take advantage of the, all the brains we have in this interview. I'm looking for the questions. I can reread that one. <laughs> I think that if, if I understand the first question and, and you know, despite my, uh, my hope and my optimism, I also believe that you have to stay focused on I mean, the uh, eyes on the prize to keep to, to really know that it's um, freedom is not free. And I, I I could spout all of these all these bromides, you know, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance, and they're all true, because that's what we have to do. Part of the thing where people, uh, you know, when people got uh, were caught up in the euphoria of the uh, Obama election and what have you, I remember I was working precincts in Ohio, going door to door, uh, where I was a volunteer. And um, I called back at the night of election night and I was talking to my husband who was at a who was at a watch party and they were all excited. And Derek Bell doesn't didn't always get all excited about that. This is the same guy who wrote faces at the bottom of the well. Right. <laughs> and so he was so thrilled. And I said to him that night that now the work begins because we cannot take. Any we cannot. Given the history of this country, and that's also the history of immigration, which changes, and as people as people go from uh, 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 you know categories where they come in and they're not considered 
white and then they become white. Whiteness has become a property right for, for many for, for many people in, in this country. But, you know, we have to maintain a sense of where it is we want to go in the whole as, as a civilization and as a country. And we just have to be focused on constantly improving and making it better for not for ourselves, but for the people who are the generation coming behind. We have enough history to know that once you have an advance in this country, you also have a you also have a retreat. You know, you have quote reconstruction, what have you, and that is the default to white supremacy. I'll just add that I'm woke and I'm proud. <laughs> Say it loud, I'm woke and I'm proud. <laughs> and stay woke. You know, I, I encourage people to have a set of talking points. Be informed on the issues that matter to you. And when you have the opportunity to be so smart in front of someone who raises a ridiculous theory, you know, I'm just looking at, and um, I appreciate Dr. Bell being here. And I know, and Dr. Eversley also mentioned her involvement with CRT, mentioning on, on TV, throwing around these letters, <coughs> CRT. Most of their audience doesn't even know what CRT stands for. And if they don't, if they do know, they don't know what it means. And, but we see how they have managed to take this term and turn it into something that has a new definition just by the letters. So be, be informed. So if you encounter someone who has, who raises this, you can answer the question, what is CRT? So it's that, that right there helps, just even in individual relationships, because that's a groundswell as people are more informed. And if you can take that and amplify it in some other way to larger groups, and you know our students will be doing that, then you're making a difference. Thank you so much um, for answering the, the question. So we have a couple more um, from the chat. I'm going to um, read on. So this one um, states, given the success of the Reagan amnesty program and the fact that it was a Reagan policy, do we foresee another opportunity to bring people currently in the country into the system of protections and benefits by legitimizing them in the same way Reagan did? And I can also repost this on the chat um, for everyone's reference. I think that's a Dr. Hernandez question. That's where I was going to. Hey. <laughs> so um, I'll jump in, but first I would be remiss if I didn't give uh, Yvette, the first chance, because she was at, at in charge of the legalization program, uh, working on policy implementation. So first, I'm going to punt it over to you, Yvette, and then I'll, I'll, I'll jump in as well. All right, I'm sorry. Just summarize the question again for me. <laughs> I was counting on you answering that. <laughs> sure. So, um, this was from, uh, give me one moment. I believe it was, oh, Shakira. This was Shakira's second question. Love Shakira. Uh, given this success of the Reagan amnesty program and the fact that it was a Reagan policy, do we foresee another opportunity to bring people currently in the country into the system of protection and benefits by legitimizing them in, a, in the same way Reagan did? Absolutely. I mean, that's it's constantly on the table. It's very difficult. It's And again, it's how those who are marketing masters have managed to make this issue a poison pen for members of Congress and senators who previously supported this very same thing. As you can look back at these, at these acts, at these bills when they were pending in the Bush administration and the Obama administration and see which Republicans had signed on to them. And some of these same Republicans are now in violent opposition to the same, to the same act to the same or the same bills, the same requests to legalize these same populations. Mm -hmm. So if we if they could have been turned this way, 
when the American population really still does not oppose many of these paths to some type of regularization for some portion or all of the population. I think it can be turned around again, depending on the leadership. But we have to have those voices a reason, those voices to, to be as loud as the voices of opposition who are saying things that are untrue. Immigrants do not commit more crimes than Americans. It's just not true, although it is betrayed that way in their media. So there have to be more voices that talk about the benefits of immigration, and those benefits are overwhelming. And one example I like to give, and just in the benefits of immigration, is that our entire medical care, our healthcare system would fall apart. I mean, Shelley mentioned her own parents, not just, you know, the home health care aides, but even at medical doctors, we would not have enough American born medical doctors to meet all of the needs of the American population. We wouldn't have enough people to do medical research. We would certainly would not. We've never had enough nurses without importing nurses. Our entire health care system would collapse without immigration. That's just one example. And you, we can go to the growers in the agricultural field and they will tell you how, how much their, you know, how their industry is so dependent on migrants. It's, you know, they're just example after example. So we need voices who are educating the public so they really understand that they are, you know, that they're being, the hood is being pulled over them by this, really the underlying thing is white supremacy. I mean, there are some people who oppose immigration and they don't even know why. And that may not be what, <laughs> what their reason is, but because they're agitated by it, by the media they watch. But the facts have to come out. I, I heard a comedian recently who said, are Mexicans lazy or are they taking our jobs? People argue, both. <laughs> you can't have it both ways. So uh, as promised, I'll just in, jump in briefly. Um, so I, I'm not as optimistic as Yvette, only because so many stars have to align for that legislation to answer your question, Jacqueline. So many stars have to legislatively align to be able to pass. And as Yvette pointed out, really the last time there was a comprehensive immigration package was in 1986. That was actually, uh, one could argue, a little bit more slightly pro-immigrant. Uh, or maybe more egalitarian, if you will. Of course, we haven't discussed all the employer sanctions that that legislation had, but we'll leave that for another day. So slight, slightly uh, less optimistic, but but hopeful uh, following uh, Janet's lead. Uh, that's why, in, in my view, we have to pay a lot more attention to those executive orders by presidents and the policy implementation process in agencies that we don't get a full view of and we can't hold fully accountable unless we pay more attention. Uh, and so President Trump is a prime example where uh, scholars have pointed out, uh, dismantled, the, dis made a concerted effort to dismantle asylum and other things in immigration and other policy areas. So it, it's it's basically a kind of looking at presidential power, a double-edged sword. If we have one that's favorable, hey, we might reach that egalitarian principle, but, but largely we may not, and there's a lot of risk. So until that comprehensive legislation comes, I urge focusing on the policy implementation process. Can I just can I just say something really quick? And it's two points. One, Neil's point about paying attention, and Yvette's point about being woke and proud. I too am woke and proud, um, and I'm teaching woke and proud. Like I, you know, I, I'm not being equivocal. I'm not trying to act like, you know. Um, that, that somehow there's no interest. I don't have a personal or subjective interest in this, in this conversation. Um, and I think it's useful as a teacher, right? Um, but my class was talking the other day about attention and, and during the last presidency, the Trump administration, everyone got to Twitter, right? And everyone wanted everything reduced down. We just survived, when I say survived, the people in this room were still here after this COVID pandemic, even though it's ongoing. And during that pandemic, everyone went online and all of our attentions have diminished. And this is the perfect time for the forces um, that are against us, the forces that are against um, the progress and freedoms of people of color. This is the perfect time for them to do all the detailed 
dismantling um, that we just saw in Shakira's questions. And I think now more than ever, we all have to just turn off the TV and turn and stop reading the, you know, the, the only two minute read articles or the three minute read articles and start bringing our stamina back to pay attention to the details. Um, because in a minute, literally, a whole bunch of progress will be completely erased and no one will notice because they're only watching the news on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or wherever they're getting it. Um, and this is something I think that everyone needs to, this idea of being woke isn't just a phrase, it is actually open your eyes and read the details and then speak them and act them. And we can't do this remotely. Sashay, can we get Naomi's question in as well, please? Yes, um, we're actually just gonna wrap up with Naomi's question. Um, so I'm gonna read that to you all. So it's gonna, it says, do you foresee a saturation point for immigrants into the U.S. at some point in the future? Or does the U.S. have an indeterminable capacity for immigrants and the growth of American citizens? Slash, how do we prepare and sustain growth? I guess I'll start. <laughs> you know, immigration does ebb and flow. When we are in a recession, there is less interest in coming to the United States. The fact that we have been able to maintain these high levels of immigration is, is just demonstrates that we can absorb the number that we have, the labor demand that draws people to come here. We have not reached a saturation point. I, you know, personally, I do believe in orderly immigration. I do believe that, you know, we need a means to manage the flows of people coming into the United States. And part of what we want to see in legislation is an entire revision of the program we have because it's not adequate to meet our needs for immigrants, much less the demand to emigrate here. The also, in terms of saturation, the U.S. is the largest economy in the world still. It is the, the still the wealthiest nation in the world. It still is the innovator and the creator. And much of that, that innovation and creation and the wealth has been driven by continued immigration, especially in our recent, recent era. And there is no reason to believe that continued immigration would cause any decline in that because it never has. So I don't, there's no reason to believe that it would. Of course, I do believe in orderly immigration and that we should be able to control and manage who enters and when, but we don't have a system of, or that functions that way that is functional. We have a system, we have the 1965 Act that has been updated occasionally, but not comprehensively, but it's not adequate to meet our needs in the US or the needs of the world. And we are part of a global community as well. Neil, I'd like to hear if you have an answer too. Sure, I'll just, just, just to jump in briefly because I think uh, Sashay and Nefti would, would like to hear closing remarks from each of you as well. Um, but I, I would just simply add that I la largely agree with Yvette and would just add that uh, whether we want to or not, Naomi, as far as uh, thinking about our, our uh, immigration system and how we change it, how we improve it, we are also at the, we also have to, are reacting to the desperate state of others who are fleeing persecution. We don't fully control that. And so we need to be ready uh, that we need to receive them, we need to help them, we need to provide the protection. And whether we want to do that or have the political will to do that, uh, they are coming and they need our help, uh, whether it be New York City or at the southern border or both. I, I just want to say or clarify my question a little bit. It really has more to do with capacity in terms of housing and capabilities as far as health care and education and the ability to, to be able to provide that for the numbers of people that uh, we uh, would be bringing in and should ho hope to bring in and that are already here. So um, I'm looking at housing situations as we now 
are dealing with and facing here in California, just to try to have that capacity for the people that are coming here that we should be able to house and take care of and feed and educate and ensure health care for those people. So my question in terms of capacity is more in line with those kinds of issues. And I, and I think that that is a genuine concern that as cities see so many arrivals and there certainly have been cities that are overwhelmed, especially our border cities, and California is seeing that too. Um, again, going back to legislation, legislation would include more funding that would go to cities to deal with immigrant, the immigrant inflows. Um, I, people are concerned about that and the distribution of immigrants around the country could be could be better managed than it is now in trying to meet labor needs. And that would that would I think be a win-win where we have, you know, the the um, meat industry in the Midwest right now, they they need more laborers to to do that, but we have you know immigrants coming into Texas and being bused to um, DC and to New York as like a reality TV show instead of you know trying to be serious about trying to meet the needs of the country. So there are a lot of other ways, you know, looking at how we manage that and how we fund and how we help cities with that. But I, I know it is a legitimate concern on in, in cities that are seeing large inflows of, of immigrants. Not only here, I just as you know, we were running out of time, but I was recently in Panama and briefed on just the, the numbers. This, there were, in, for example, in one month, there were 10,000 Venezuelans that crossed the jungle from Colombia into Panama. The very next month, there were 60,000 Venezuelans. So yes, it can be quite overwhelming when numbers, you know, fluctuate to that level, and and, and it can be a problem, and it, it is a serious problem that cities have to cons have to consider the saturation and the, and the city's capacity and the funding to meet the needs is a question that has to be answered too. Absolutely. And thank you. Okay, if we don't have any more um, comments to that question, for closing remarks, I will begin with um, Dr. Bell, followed by Yvette Lagantry, followed by Dr. Shelley Eversley, and concluding with Dr. Hernandez in that order. Well, thank you, and I, I, I don't, I'd like to say what an honor it is to have been in this conversation with the other panelists and with the people who joined us. I have two things. One is that when we look at why is there, you, we talked about people, the, the influx of uh, immigrants, particularly from South America, Central and South America, and why is that? Partly it's due to policies that we started NAFTA the North American Free Trade Act and others. So we have to look at that. Why are people so desperate to leave where they are, give up everything they have to come here? That's one thing. The other thing that I will say in connection with the, the, the why is there a similarity between the civil rights movement and the immigration? And that is that they were both are opposed by certain forces because they think of them as taking something away, the white supremacists or what have you, the power structure, taking something away rather than what the value added that these movements, the civil rights movement has given to this country, the value added that immigrants give to this country. And so it's not about what we do and so we do for them what are we what does this do for us and if we're if we take the position and that's the thing that i push that we are all in this together let's come up with reasonable solutions that that uh take into account the way we treat people like people and that we have a humane approach to um to whatever the legislation is, to whatever the, the migration is, to whatever the immigration patterns are. So that's what I will leave you with. I'll just say that immigration is. It's not an if or a what. Immigration is, and demographically, we are going to a plurality 
Um, yes, it'd be majority minority, but we're, we're really going to have representation from different ethnic groups. The, you know, European ancestry will be one, um, African ancestry will be another, you know, Hispanic ancestry will be another, and Asia will be another. And, and, and the difference, what we see by maybe 2060, is it's they're, they're going to be at least among the Asians, Hispanics and the Asians, pretty much an equal representation um, among the minorities. The Asians are supposed to surpass at, this, at the rate of migration, these things surpass Hispanics. The African ancestry population is not increasing at the same rate, although we are seeing some more you know, West African in particular immigration, but it just it's a fact of life. And so we should just get used to it. Our, our population should um, also be better educated. So with the, with the expectation that this is what's happening, we should hope that power will be shared fairly and we should, you know, agitate for that in part of you know, this preparation for this change because it is what's going to happen. I'm just going to say that I'm really, um, I didn't even know how this was going to go. And I'm so excited that it went this way. And just wondering two things, you know, a couple of takeaways that we can sustain this. Something that you that said that um, I haven't heard very many people say before, that the United States is capable of, of, of welcoming um, large numbers of people um, and, and needs it in order to sustain itself. And that is a really hopeful thing to to kind of lean into. And then to think about attention, um, I think that's something that we can all do is pay attention and consistently pay attention and speak up um, because we're hearing from a whole bunch of people who are not paying attention, who are very loud. And so we should pay attention and speak up. And um, thank you, uh, Neil, for including me on this and thank you Yvette and Janet for being so brilliant and fierce and woke. Um, thank you. Thank you, Shelly. I'll, I'll just briefly say uh, three things, two suggestions and again, uh, kudos. Uh, first suggestion is to learn more about the about our uh, incredible panelists and their work. I put a note in the chat. You can look at their books, a terrific presentation by Yvette. I encourage you to also follow Yvette as well. She does amazing work with uh, MIRR as its advisory board chair. The second thing is to Jackie's question earlier in terms of groups and organizations that you might consider, uh, remember about home, meaning Baruch. You have professors Rob Smith, Sarah Bishop, uh, Felicia Arteaga, uh, Els de Graw, and, and little old me, we all do work on immigration and our work and their work, I should say, impacts and has the potential to have a bigger impact on the immigration policy. And you could join with them and join with us and work with us. Uh, and lastly, I just want to again reiterate my kudos to the leadership of Nef Neftali for, uh, Nefti for bringing us together for designing the program. And thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Nefti, you're in mute. Yes, I was muted. Thank you, Eva. Thank you all so much. And to the audience that stayed through till 730, this was recorded and it will be sent out to everyone that registered um, along with the thank you note. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Thank you, Yvette Lagantri. Thank you, Dr. Shelley. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez. This was phenomenal. And I am with Dr. Bell while I am hopefully optimistic that things can and will change. And I hope out of this conversation, all of us are a little bit woke and are paying attention. Everyone, have a good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>